All right, well, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me here, um, actually to uh, allow me to give a talk here. And uh, uh, today we'll be talking about uh, a new computing paradigm we call MEM computing, which is uh, computing with and in memory. It's inspired by the brain, uh, but I will tell you which features of the brain we actually try to uh, get uh, and, and then uh, uh, reproduce them in the solid state. So this is work done mostly with uh, uh, my uh, collaborator in uh, UCSD, Fabio Traversa, and there are a few papers that you, if you're interested, uh, you can take a look. There is also a Scientific American we got invited to write last year. Uh, it's just for uh, fun, but it uh, um, you know, outlines a little bit the ideas. So let me, uh, uh, quickly I will go through the motivation. This is a crowd that probably doesn't need much of motivation. And then I will tell you what we try to learn from the uh, brain, uh, uh, brain's computational ability. And this will lead me to a new computing paradigm we call the universal man computing machines. And uh, uh, by the way, I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm not a computer scientist uh, or even engineer. Um, but uh, we can prove uh, mathematically that these machines, if they can be built uh, in, uh, uh, in practice, uh, they can actually solve very complex problems like NP-complete problems in polynomial time with polynomial resources. We have actually a, a real demonstration of this mathematically. I uh, already hear uh, uh, some, uh, some noise from the computer scientists. Um, at, we are not proving NP equal to P because the, the question of NP equal to P is a question that has a meaning only within the Turing paradigm. If you are out of the Turing paradigm, this question has no meaning. And to show you, uh, in fact, uh, how uh, you can actually put them in practice with actual devices, I'll show you how to factorize and how to solve the subset sum problem, which is an NP hard problem, uh, with digital versions of these machines, okay? And uh, uh, so this is the plan of my, of my talk. So uh, for motivation, let me go back to uh, the original uh, universal Turing machine. It's essentially an object uh, that uh, um, operates on a tape. You have, uh, through a set of instructions, uh, you have a tape head that, that actually moves the left, right, or stays where it is um, on an infinite tape. So this was formalized a long time ago by Turing. I won't go into the math, but through this math, you can actually prove all the theorems uh, and all the statements in complexity theory. This generated uh, literally the field of a complexity theory. Uh, but irrespective of this mathematical definition, I want you to notice that this is a machine that essentially maps uh, integers into integers. So it maps uh, zeros and ones in the representation, the simplest representation we have, into zeros and ones. And so the fact that it does this allows you to scale it up uh, uh, quite easily if it, if it is implemented uh, uh, in hardware. And how it is nowadays implemented in hardware, where you all know that uh, we use mostly the von Neumann architecture, and uh, apart from uh, uh, details uh, and an input and output, uh, this contains a CPU, which contains also a control unit, tells the machine what to do, what program to execute, and then an arithmetic logic unit. But then there is also a memory, and clearly there is a, a, a unique, uh, these two features are separate. In fact, this is the main feature of an architecture like this. Uh, the memory and the CPU are physically uh, separate. Now, this leads to what we call now von Neumann uh, bottleneck, in which uh, you have a limited uh, transfer rate between the CPU and the memory because you have a, a unique bus over which the data have to uh, shuffle back and forth. In reality, this is not, as you know, the, the actual Problem. The problem is energy. So these machines uh, um, are projected to, to consume a lot of energy in the coming years. And so uh, this is only the projections for uh, data centers. We are about here, uh, about 500 terawatts per hour. And it's, it's projected to increase. This uh, not even taking into account uh, you know, laptops or cell phones and so forth. So we need to come up with something else. But again, this is probably not the crowd that uh, needs this, uh, uh, a reminder on this. And uh, uh, how do we proceed? Well, I uh, would like to learn from the brain, but my goal is not to uh, emulate the brain, so I don't want to emulate the brain at all. What I want to uh, uh, understand is, uh, are there uh, features, a minimal amount of features that the brain has uh, that we can transfer in the solid state, uh, and if this is the case, what type of computational uh, power do we gain uh, by having those features uh, reproduced in the solid state? So we know that the, uh, the brain has uh, uh, important features. One of these is that it computes and stores on the same physical platform. So there is no separate CPU and memory, and, uh, and uh, uh, the whole computation is done on the same uh, physical uh, lo location or parts of, uh, of the brain. 
Then it is uh, intrinsically parallel. This is uh, not the parallelism we are used to in which we have uh, several processors, like I imagine this one that I'm using, um, in which you break the code into several uh, pieces, let's say four, and then the, each CPU will actually process uh, uh, its own part of the, of the uh, program and with its own memory. By intrinsic par parallelism, I mean really that all the units uh, will actually act uh, uh, in the same, uh, at the same time on all the data. It's essentially a cooperative, a collective behavior of all the units. This is uh, an analogy, uh, I mean an analogy of this is uh, an entanglement in quantum mechanics in which, uh, that is exploited by uh, quantum computers to actually solve, uh, for example, factorization. So you have essentially a collective state that is able to explore a, a large, exponentially large phase space because it operates collectively on the data. So uh, the other feature uh, is that uh, it is a functionally polymorphic in the sense that uh, it doesn't change, it doesn't need to change uh, uh, the topology to actually uh, uh, solve a different uh, uh, problems. So you can uh, solve uh, different problems with the same type of topology. And finally, an important feature which uh, uh, the neuroscientists don't call it this way, but we call it information overhead, and it's uh, uh, the following. If I have actually n neurons uh, that connect with each other through synapses, uh, uh, the data are not simply uh, manipulated uh, through uh, the synapses themselves, but also through the topology, through the connectivity of uh, the whole network. So uh, to give you an example of this, suppose I have uh, uh, K resistors uh, that store uh, resistances, right, uh, as information. So uh, you can actually store uh, data on each one of those. But this is a 1D object that is connected, where uh, these objects are connected to each other. And so if I could measure, let's say, between uh, this point and this point, then I could actually uh, measure the sum of the resistances, right? Because the, the resistance in series is the sum of these. So if I could measure somehow any point uh, in between, not only I know the data on each one of those, but I actually have computed more than the units themselves. In fact, in this particular example, I have computed a quadratic uh, type of uh, uh, information, right? So if I apply a bias from here to here, then I can actually compute more than just the units themselves. It's the same thing that, uh, that we call information overhead in, uh, in, uh, in the brain. So these are the three features, uh, and they're probably, uh, I'm sure there are uh, many more, but these are the main ones that uh, uh, we wanted to uh, reproduce in the solid state and ask the question whether uh, a paradigm that has these type of features uh, um, uh, would be uh, powerful or not. I mean, what type of paradigm you, you would get. So what we argue is that uh, uh, all these features are, um, you know, uh, can be put together into what we call a computational memory. So the, the key here is uh, the memory in the system. And by memory here, I don't mean simply storing information, but literally time non locality. So the ability to actually adapt in time uh, uh, through the signal that, that comes to the, uh, to the units. And how do we realize this in practice? Well, this is easy because uh, any physical system uh, if I apply a, uh, an input uh, uh, to any physical system and I have a response, then the response function depends on the input itself uh, and then on possible internal state variables, for example, uh, spin uh, polarization, um, at atomic position, anything. There is no physical system that can respond instantaneously to any uh, perturbation, and so any physical system shows memory. Now, the question is whether that memory is uh, too uh, uh, short in the sense that uh, uh, I need uh, very fast measurements to actually um, um, get that memory, but in general, I have uh, any physical system uh, can be written in this form. And in fact, uh, I, uh, this is, uh, physical systems can be either passive or active, most devices in their full form, not necessarily switch, uh, in the switch form uh, like uh, we use them now for these uh, devices. And if uh, the input and output are voltages and currents, then the response is the resistance. We call this memory resistance. Uh, if it is a uh, uh, charge and voltage, uh, the response function is a capacitance, a mem capacitance, and so forth. Uh, a, a flux and current will give rise to uh, a mem inductor. But these things, uh, which can be realized in practice, are, simply, uh, are just a, a subset of all these uh, uh, cases. In fact, uh, uh, it's much more general this than uh, uh, these cases. 
And, you, and uh, these, uh, the important thing of these uh, systems uh, uh, is that these elements is that if they are biased, uh, let's say I have a capacitor, MEM capacitor with charge and voltage here, and I vary the voltage uh, uh, with a certain frequency, clearly at very high frequency or very low frequency, if there are internal state variables, uh, they will not be able to follow a very high frequency or they will easily follow a low frequency. So the uh, charge ver versus voltage characteristics uh, doesn't show much of a hysteresis. But if I, have, uh, if I work at a particular frequency and with a particular amplitude, then uh, there is a delay between uh, uh, the motion of uh, the internal variables uh, and the external bias, and so I have uh, hysteresis. And so you start seeing here that I can use this uh, as a zero and one, a digital mode, or I can use the entire curve as an analog mode. So I have now, an object that has memory, but can actually process information. And these are the types of objects that we would like to, uh, to use. Now, uh, to tell you, these things can be made, as I said, uh, uh, using passive devices, but you can actually make them uh, using MOS technology. Again, uh, you take a transistor and you actually use a feedback mechanism between the gate and, let's say, the, the source or the drain, and this thing will show hysteresis. The important thing is that it emulates the hysteresis of particular uh, frequencies. So you don't need uh, really special uh, materials or special devices. What you need is emulating something that behaves this way. So this leads me to, uh, to the concept of uh, uh, machines that can be built out of networks of these uh, memory elements. And so these machines uh, uh, have a control unit. It clearly has to tell the machine what to, uh, what to execute, uh, an input and an output, and then it will have what we call MEM processors. So these are, uh, um, this is a network of uh, units uh, composed possibly of uh, transistors uh, together with other uh, elements, but especially with elements that have uh, time non locality, memory. And so if uh, the control unit sends uh, a signal, then the state, the collective state of this machine, like in quantum computing, but this is a classical concept, the collective state of this machine will change according to the pro problem you're uh, trying to solve, and through a transition function will actually uh, solve it, and uh, uh, the solution will be stored uh, in the units themselves, all of them or part of, the, of those units. So the UMMs are objects that compute with and in memory, you can define them uh, uh, as digital or analog, uh, but clearly these are just words, but you can actually uh, do like uh, Turing did and define them uh, mathematically. Now the reason why we need this is that we need to prove then theorems, uh, a lot of them actually, to prove uh, what is the power of these machines uh, compared to uh, Turing, uh, the Turing machines. So uh, in general, what are the properties of these machines? Well, these are not Turing machines. They operate on the collective state uh, of, the, of the system, uh, and, uh, but we can prove that, in fact, that they can simulate uh, any Turing machine, so they're Turing complete. Uh, the proof uh, I have to send you to, to this paper because this is a mathematical proof. Now, the open question, and I don't have, I don't have an answer, is whether they are equivalent to Turing machines, whether all the problems that Turing machines can solve can be solved by uh, UMMs or vice versa. This we cannot prove it because it's not easy uh, uh, to formalize uh, information overhead uh, using Turing machines. Now, if I have a machines like this, so suppose uh, I have them, this is a mathematical concept uh, up to this point, uh, if I want to solve a very complex problem, generally in complexity theory, problems are uh, represented as uh, trees, uh, solution trees, so you have uh, a Turing machine like this one, for example, will go through all the elements of this tree, exploring all the possibilities. But if I have uh, intrinsic parallelism at each step of the computation, the machine can actually uh, do this in a massively parallel, intrinsically parallel way, li uh, similar to what a quantum computer does. But without anything else, uh, you would need uh, an exponentially large number of resources uh, to actually do this. But if I have information overhead, and so I embed information in the topology of my network, then I can prove that I need only polynomial resources and polynomial time, obviously, because of massive parallelism. So these are, uh, again, if you want to see, the, these are uh, uh, proofs that you can um, you know, demonstrate uh, and go through uh, yourself. So uh, can we realize this uh, in practice? So this is a, a paradigm uh, uh, up to this point is simply mathematical. The question is whether we can realize it in practice. And so what do we need uh, if we want to realize this in practice? Well, we, want, uh, uh, we, we can choose uh, digital uh, or analog, right? But analog has the problem that it's, easy, it's not easy to scale up. 
uh, uh, precisely because we don't have an infinite amount of precision to actually represent uh, uh, real numbers. So the ideal thing would be to have uh, uh, input and output which are digital, so actually map integers into integers. And then let the physics do the rest if there is uh, uh, for the transition, representation of the transition function. This, uh, this uh, will be important because we, want, uh, uh, we don't want to have issues with precision and we want these machines to be scalable. And the other thing, we don't want to go the way of quantum computers, uh, no offense to anybody who's working on quantum computers, but we want these machines to be really easy to fabricate, okay? We don't want to work at millikelvin. They have to work at room temperature. They have to be easily uh, made with standard technology. So the, the, best, uh, uh, the best candidates for this are circuit elements. So any uh, element, as I told you, memory resistors, memory capacitor, transistors are used in a way that is not simply a switch. And uh, uh, these elements uh, put together form a complex uh, uh, system, right? And you can write it down in a form that is essentially a set of differential equations where the variables are the voltages and the currents in the circuit. And clearly, you would have uh, uh, equilibrium positions, so you have to look at uh, how this dynamical system, now I'm working with a dynamical system, very complex uh, dynamical system, and I want uh, this dynamical system to reach uh, clearly equilibrium uh, uh, states. Uh, I, I don't want the system to reach uh, either a limit cycle or a, a stranger tractor, otherwise I'm not solving uh, a problem. So in other words, what I want is that my, the equilibrium points on my system are the solutions of the problem I want to solve. And if there are solutions, there shouldn't be uh, limit cycles and uh, stranger tractors. So what, uh, how do I guarantee that a system that is described by these differential equations, which ultimately is a circuit, uh, has uh, uh, those properties? Well, in uh, uh, functional analysis of dynamical systems, we know of uh, systems that are called point dissipative. Dissipative here doesn't mean dissipative in the physical sense, it's a topological sense. Why these are very uh, useful for us? Because we can guarantee, and this has been proved uh, before, not by us, that if I have a point dissipative system, then uh, I, I have a global attractor, which means that irrespective of the initial conditions, the system will go to a global attractor. But uh, the global attractor could be formed by anything, right? It could be formed by equilibrium points, uh, limit cycles, and uh, strange attractors. What we want uh, is that the equilibrium points, as I said, have to be the solutions of the problem that you're looking at. Not only that, but we want that the solution, irrespective of the initial condition, given a size of the problem, will be reached exponentially fast. Because if it is very slow, then it's useless. Not only that, but we want that if I increase the size of the problem, then the convergence rate scales at most polynomially with size, okay? Not just the convergence rate, but also the energy. And as I said uh, uh, before, if there are equilibrium points in either limit cycles nor stranger factors that can uh, coexist, otherwise we don't solve the problem. So these are the desired properties, okay? Uh, now, I'll show you how to actually uh, do it in practice, and we have demonstrated, in fact, all of these, okay? for the particular problems uh, that I, I show you. So I, I show you how to factorize, and I show you the one instance, uh, I mean one instance, uh, the subset sum problem, you know that uh, since it's a complete uh, problem, I solve one, I can solve all of them. In fact, we solve KSAT uh, to solve both of them, as you will see. So uh, we want to do it with digital versions of these machines, and so if I look at uh, uh, the digital machines we have right now, they operate this way. So you give uh, uh, inputs, and uh, uh, through a, a, a gate, uh, you get an output. And then you put these things uh, in a series of gates, uh, and uh, uh, given an input, uh, sequentially, even for parallel machines, uh, these machines will solve uh, the problem. Now, we don't want this, why? Because uh, if I have a very difficult problem like factorization, I uh, give you a number n, which is factorizable in uh, p times q. Clearly, if I give you p, time, uh, p and q, you know n, but what I want is the reverse. I give you n, uh, uh, you have to tell me what is uh, p and q. So I need something that actually operates uh, in reverse. So I need uh, logic that is not uh, concerned about input and output. In fact, it's totally ir ir irrelevant what is input and output. Suppose this is an end and this is one one, this would be one. But if I arrive here with one, I want only one one. I don't want zero one, zero zero one zero, otherwise it would not be satisfied. 
And the same thing, if this is zero, I want only the three possibilities that satisfy the gate, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one. I don't want one, one. Then it will be the entire network, the collective uh, uh, state of these self-organizable logic gates that will force each one of them to satisfy the global solution, okay? So this is, these are the type of gates that I want. So, and then when they're put in a network with appropriate topology, appropriate information ahead, I get the solution. Now, all NP problems can uh, be written in logical uh, circuits. And uh, to give you an example, suppose again the factorization, take n is equal p and q and write them in bits. So nj, pj, and qj are the zeros and ones that represent the integers. Now elementary uh, school math, if I multiply p times q, then I get n, and I can go through the math through the remainders, right? This is elementary uh, mathematics. But the remainders are writable as sums of products of these uh, uh, factors, uh, XORs of n's. So the whole thing can be written as a logic circuit. If I have the p's here and the q's here, I multiply q0 times p0 times p1 and so forth, q1 by p0 and so forth, I sum and so forth, and I get, in this case, 35. Clearly, that's how our logic machines operate, so they operate this way. But if I want, uh, given the number, want a p and q, I, I need something that goes in reverse. Now, this can be done if you have memory. Time non locality. So we actually uh, um, um, devised uh, uh, universal logic gates that actually can operate uh, in reverse whether the input uh, is this way or the input is this way. We use memristors, but as I told you, you can actually use emulators of memristors like uh, uh, MOS uh, in particular configurations. So these uh, logic gates will satisfy each one of the, of the gates, and then when they're put into the, uh, the whole circuit, they will uh, get the solution. Now, Clearly, you, uh, you need to prove all these statements. So that's exactly what our 13 theorems are all about in this paper. So you have to prove that given those circuits and those uh, self-organizable logic gates, they actually do satisfy you know, that uh, the, the only equilibrium points are the solutions. They are exponentially fast to reach them. Uh, they scale polynomially and so forth. Now, I give you here an example of uh, factorization for 1,073. It's 11 bits. This is the biggest version of this circuit here. And uh, uh, since uh, we are working with a global attractor, uh, it's, uh, you can choose any initial condition. It will go there. Um, this is a simulation. Clearly, you have to do this in uh, hardware if you want to scale it up. But uh, the, the circles are the inputs that represent the zeros and ones of this. The uh, uh, dots here are the voltages. Uh, these are circuits, okay? So are the voltages uh, at the gates, XOR, OR, and so forth. Uh, black is one, uh, uh, white is zero, and you will see all the shades uh, of gray. So this is uh, a simulation in which this thing uh, 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 collectively solves the problem. And uh, uh, so we did these simulations uh, uh, for uh, up to 18 bits because it becomes, uh, simulating this thing, it becomes very demanding at a certain point. What if uh, I want to uh, uh, find, uh, I want to actually factorize something that's already a factor, 47, so there is no solution? Well, this thing goes forever, so that it doesn't stop. And what about uh, an MP uh, hard problem like the MP complete version of the subset, which is uh, uh, I give you n integers and uh, another one s, and I ask you if there is or not a subset that sums to s. And in this case, actually, we find that subset, not just the solve the uh, decision version. So we, this is uh, uh, the subset up to uh, 9, 9, 9 in uh, uh, number of bits and now number of precisions. Okay, so this thing uh, can be scaled up, it scales quadratically. Uh, uh, in hardware, clearly, and uh, the energy also uh, scales polynomially. So this is uh, something you can make. It's clearly not Turing, but you can make it. Okay, let me conclude this. Uh, I showed you that if I take uh, uh, three main features uh, from the brain uh, and I try to reproduce them in th to the solid state, in particular the memory, time non locality, I have uh, an incredible uh, power, actually. And uh, you can actually make these machines, so they're not uh, difficult to make like uh, uh, quantum computers. Here is an example where you take the, the architecture of uh, um, flash memory and you replace capacitors with mem capacitors. And clearly this opens up a lot of possibilities for low power computing, machine learning, real time computing and so forth. So this is, uh, this is really uh, promising. And with this uh, I acknowledge uh, my collaborator. Uh, if you're interested you can uh, take a look at the the latest paper where we have all the proofs of these statements. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. Take any questions.
Nobody? All right. Go ahead. So do you essentially solve uh, the circuit sat, circuit sat problem with annealing? No. No, because uh, uh, this is not annealing. So you solve the set by forcing a, a, a particular topology, and so uh, essentially the electrons will go from a high potential to a low potential, and that's it, in, through a single lane. Think about uh, a maze, for example. If I uh, do it in hardware, the maze, uh, uh, the electrons will follow only one path. So this is a similar, but it's much more complicated. So it's not annealing at all. It's literally solving a dynamical system as, as the, uh, the one of uh, uh, electrons that flow into a circuit. It's a steady state. Hmm? So far, I don't see the distinction. The what? That uh, annealing is a totally different, right? It's a, yeah. I mean, it looks for an energy landscape. This is, doesn't look for an energy landscape. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.